Bonjour, hello, Tenakoto Katoa, and welcome to this live panel discussion on decarbonizing urban transport and industries. I'm Vincent Labrador. I'm the business development manager of the French New Zealand Chamber of Commerce. And today, this is the first live panel discussion part of the French, uh, the French Australian New Zealand Business Days in New Zealand. Welcome, everyone. I will introduce you to our moderator today, Alexandre Lanier. Alexandre was appointed as director, as country director of Veolia in New Zealand almost four years ago. He has a solid technical and operational knowledge of the water and wastewater industry. And over the past 20 years, he has led a variety of business units within numerous countries, including France, Australia, Argentina, Mexico, and other countries. So we are very honored to have you as a moderator today, Alex, and obviously uh, you as well, the, the other speakers today. And um, so over to you now for this panel discussion, Alex. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, and before we start, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the Maori people as the Tangata Fenua Aotearoa, the people of the land of New Zealand, and the Treaty of Waitangi, which is committed to the inclusion of all people. This, uh, this panel discussion today really is something I have at heart. It's about decarbonizing urban transport and industries. Um, and I think it's, uh, it fits well with Veolia's purpose, which is contribute to human progress, you know, by committing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to achieve a more sustainable future. And clearly, decarbonizing urban transport and industries is a big component of, uh, of achieving a, a, sustainable, a more sustainable future. So um, before we start uh, the discussion itself, uh, we'll be together uh, an hour and a half. Um, roughly 45 minutes of it will be around uh, a discussion with all our panelists, uh, and we'll leave 30 minutes for, uh, for questions and uh, a wrap up. So I'll do a quick introduction of our, um, of our panelists. And it's, uh, look, I, I feel really, um, let's say, lucky today and privileged to have, um, to have everyone on this panel. Uh, it doesn't happen every day. Uh, I'll start with Dwayne. So Dwayne Boyce is the principal advisor and strategic development manager for sustainability for the New Zealand and South Pacific at Bureau Veritas. We've got with us as well, Nicole Blackburn, who's the industry sales director for the Pacific at Schneider Electric. And we've got Peter Lansing, who's the managing director of Transdev here in New Zealand. So if I can ask, each of you, Dwayne, Nicole, and Peter, to introduce yourself. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Alex. Um, kia ora. Fakalof layatu. Bonjour. Uh, I extend very warm greetings from uh, Auckland City. Uh, myself, I'm a structural engineer uh, in the military for 15 years and responsible for asset integrity, so uh, primarily aviation um, aspects. From there, I've uh, moved into the oil and gas sector, quite interestingly. Um, learned a very large amount uh, about how that industry works, how it works in terms of safety, compliance, pollution side. And then I've uh, moved across into marine and offshore where we're taking a lot of those lessons learned and then looking to enable the change towards sustainability. Uh, working now, we have a huge focus on corporate social responsibility, engaging with local people within the region, and then doing what, what is right for the environment. And that's a, a big side that I look forward to talking to you about this morning. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, as introduced, Nicole Backroom from Schneider Electric. Um, uh, if I recap a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, where I've come from, um, I've had approximately 20 years within industrial sectors spanning um, globally from construction across to maritime and now in industrial and process automation. I'm always focused on identifying and helping businesses find solutions towards their sustainability goals and digitization goals. And I'm um, very passionate about the, just the human capital impact that, um, that that has on the world. And very excited to be um, joining my fellow panelists here today for, for a great discussion. Thank you, Nicole, and kia ora koutou. Merci beaucoup, Alex. Um, it's a great opportunity to be part of this panel today. My name is Peter Lensing. I'm Managing Director for Transdev here in Auckland. 
and um, you've just heard from my boss, the Chief Officer for New Zealand, Greg Pollock, um, about our railway and bus operations across New Zealand, but also uh, globally. And like Greg, um, sustainability is it's, it's a topic that's very close to my heart, and it's certainly one of the reasons why I love to work for a global public transport company like, uh, like Transdev, which has got a wonderful purpose of empowering freedom to move and serving the common good. And uh, decarbonization is obviously a make or break topic at the moment for sustainability. Um, I've been in Auckland now for four years, um, uh, running the, uh, the railway on behalf of uh, Auckland Transport. Before that, I was operations director for one of the major railway companies in London. And I also uh, was responsible for the operation of uh, one of the bus operations in London, the, the double deck buses. So with a background in uh, public transport, that's, uh, that's where my, my heart is. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So uh, thanks, Vincent, for the, for the introduction. So I'm Alex, as Vincent said, so I've been working for Veolia for 30 years now currently based in New Zealand in charge of Veolia's operation here. Um, you know, as you know, Veolia is across the waste, water and uh, energy businesses uh, where each of them has, has basically some, some opportunities in, uh, in decarbonizing. So let's start with the, um, with the open discussion um, and, and I'll just throw the first question to the air. How is the international community approaching decarbonization? Absolutely. Um, if, if you're happy, Alex, I'll, I'll jump on that as a for a sort of um, aspect to look on. So what we're seeing internationally is is two key steps that that's happening. And the first is actions to understand. And then the second is, is actions to address. So um, the process we've seen is carbon mapping. So in the international piece uh, industry, state agencies are looking at understanding what the actual carbon footprint is and then from that mapping uh, the steps are then to go through and address and for um, particular parties who have you know well financed and you know I, I look at some of the ferry contracts and the work happening over in Australia they're able to jump in straight away and just just buy and go hey this technology is good uh, it's clean, we're going to go in and do it, and uh, we'll do our best to mitigate the risks, but we think it'll work. Whereas for people that are taking a more interim step, uh, they're, they're looking at mapping, understanding where things are coming from, and then from that understanding piece, looking at uh, addressing it. But behind that, there's also a third aspect, and you know, I think this is a contentious thing, but I'll put it out. There's also some paralysis. So uh, a lot of what we're seeing in the um, conversations, discussions with, with industry is, hey, we want to do this. We want to meet a certain requirement. We've got an IMO guideline we have to meet, but we don't know how to do it. And so, you know, the, the third part we're seeing is people just trying to watch and, and see what's on the horizon. And, um, you know, that's where I'd like to pass on to my fellow panel members. You know, when, when you're dealing with a, a situation of change or when you've seen it with clients or contracts, uh, have you experienced as well people wanting something good but not really knowing how to get there? Yeah, I might jump in there, Dwayne, and absolutely agree with you. And it, it reality is it's an everyday experience is that we know we need to do something. It's just a matter of how do we actually get started. Um, there, there is lots of support out there for, for businesses to help guide them on this journey. It comes just from various different, different aspects. Um, and perhaps perhaps where I see it, if we take it down to maybe a more of a solution or a practical level, and I think that's a good starting point, is for people that, for businesses that don't know where to start, is bringing it down to something that's tangible and practical for them. And then you can always work back up to the big, the big picture and, and, and how those practical aspects can um, help enable that. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is that that every sector in reality is, is perhaps relying on about four pillars. So looking at those practical examples, it's energy waste reduction, including energy productivity and a shift away from energy intensive um, products and services. 100% um, renewable electricity, uh, as we know, um, and then electrification uh, and then shifting away from fossil fuels and then even non-energy emission reductions, and so how to offset res uh, residual emissions. And if I look specifically to the industrial sectors, if we just take it now, just go back up one step, 
energy efficiency, circular economy, and then material substitution, and hydrogen. Um, so much talk about hydrogen and, and the benefits that that, that can bring in. And um, I suppose that's how I can sort of see businesses on a practical level looking at how they can approach decarbonisation. Peter? Yeah, I will of course focus on the on the transport side and, and, and public transport specifically, because as, as I said, as a major operator in, in, in public transport, we're, we're naturally engaged in the fight against global warming. It's, uh, it's, it's our first fight actually in everything that we're doing. Um, and in Australia and New Zealand through our climate change policy, we, we are working to with the lower, the lower our greenhouse gas emissions across all of our operations by 30% by 2030. So by setting targets, uh, it helps committing clients, partners, communities to achieve that mood shift to, uh, to public transport and improving the services and highlighting the sustainability benefits of public transport. So when, when you look at the international approach to it, for example, the Australasian Railway Association has just brought out their sustainability strategy just to help the international community with what Dwayne was just saying is where, where do we start and where, what should we focus on? And if I, if I then just look at our, our trends that focus on it, 56% um, of our vehicles currently already operate on a Euro 6 uh, emission standards and, and more than 20% of our vehicles are already equipped with eco driving systems and zero emission buses is growing significantly already at the moment. Um, alongside the corresponding increase in renewable uh, uh, generation capacity that what Nicole was just uh, referring to as, as well. So in New Zealand, we're, we're quite lucky to enjoy renewable energy uh, generated power, but yeah, I know many parts of Australia aren't, and, and many parts of the world aren't, aren't that lucky. So e-buses will play a, a big part in it. If I look at it in, internationally, um, I mentioned my European background, uh, and the approach to decarbonization. Uh, passengers in Europe start to vote, vote with their feet at the moment. And uh, clearly uh, a big shift away from, uh, for example, air travel to train travel. Uh, there, is, there, is that, there is a clear understanding that there needs to something, something needs to happen. And in Sweden, for example, there's the, the hashtag stay on the ground campaign uh, where it's actually uh, it, it, it's a shame almost to fly now if you're, if you're uh, uh, in, in Sweden and, and the numbers of Swedes taking the train for domestic journeys has risen dramatically with danger dropping. So we see in Europe already a, a big change in public transport where the international the intercity network has been expanded, night trains have been introduced, it's almost, almost a renaissance of, um, of railways and, and, and I believe that from a transport perspective there's a very clear steer on what needs to happen. And I can imagine, like Dwayne said, it's sometimes harder in, uh, in other industries. Um, Peter, oh. you've, oh, sorry, Alex, there's, um, there's something Peter raised, which I think is a great point, which is people vote with their feet. And, uh, you know, in our debate today, I really want to talk uh, and, you know, talk on some of the contentious things. So I, I, it's wonderful to hear the work from Schneider, from Transdev, and, and Alex, going back to the, you know, original question, internationally, what do we see? you know, brilliant progress, brilliant adoption, social reform. But then I can also, you know, if we look at the challenges that's come out from the recent COP meeting. And then if we look on a even a more local scale, what we're getting is concern. And as, as people saying, we, we really want this, but we're worried. And uh, I'll use a local example. Um, with our inshore fishing fleet, there's 168 vessels. Um, given the vintage of those vessels, if we just move them to internal combustion engines, which are IMO tier two, clean, we'd save 10,800 tons of CO2 equivalent per annum, just by going to new internal combustion engines. And that's not even talking about the uh, ability to prepare them for um, midlife upgrade to, to zero emissions. But a real key narrative I've been getting back when we talk to people, and this I think reflects in that larger international space is, how do I charge it? How do I know it's reliable? And, um, and how can I have the confidence that, you know, the combustion engines have because it's such a, a, a persistent thing. And so, you know, what's the international community doing? I think it's 
a, a, almost a polar response. And, and that's sort of why I raised the point. People are carbon mapping, or if people are a bit more brave, they're jumping in. But a really large amount of people, uh, and uh, you know, people, industries, companies, state, state agencies, uh, have that hesitancy. And throughout our discussion this morning, I, I really want to talk about the challenges and the, the warts and all and the, the honest piece of it. And, and I think, you know, looping back, we need to work to address the, the naysayers or, or the people that have genuine questions so that we can bring them from that camp over to this side where we are anti-flying because of the footprint. We're pro-public transport. We're pro-systems that use renewable energy. And so I think the real challenge and the subtext behind you know, what's happening in the international community is effort is really being put in and really being put on on our side through Bureau Veritas to have that understanding to de-risk the process. And, and that's, that's probably the, the, the biggest piece I see as, the, as a genuine effort in that field. So Duane, you talked about hesitancy. Um, Peter or Nicole, what would you say are some of the other biggest hurdles for New Zealand and Australia? Um, I mean, Duane raised some really great points there, and I think he addressed it just in the first question around not, not knowing where to start. And um, perhaps it's, it's, a, it's a factor of waiting to see uh, a, clear, a clear roadmap or other case studies and examples um, I think that definitely plays into it. Um, I'm, let's, I mean, if we're talking warts and all and the brutal facts here is, is making these changes also comes at a cost. So it's um, understanding and mapping what this looks like for, for my business as an example to make sure that I'm making the right investment that leads to both the goals of energy savings uh, for me as a business because I've got fiduciary duty there to, to do so but then also that it makes sense for environmental reasons. And importantly, that when, when we're looking at those changes that I'm making, that it, it is actually overall looking at um, the, the right goals that link, link with um, what's important and what the strategic initiatives are for, for my business and, of, of course, the sustainability aspect. I think perhaps that comes down to, I mean, looking at the investment and understanding just the cost implication is maybe it's a case of lack of awareness of the support uh, that is available to help businesses move forward in this, in this area uh, and the relevant types of funding that is available. Um, that could be through green funding from banks, um, um, investment and funding coming from governments and, and, other, and other bodies. I think that um, from what I hear is, is that that is one thing that definitely can provide, can provide a challenge uh, along with that, not knowing where to start, as we've we have, we already addressed. Um, Peter, I'm not sure if you're if you see the same. Uh, I, I, again, I'll, I'll put I'll put my transport hat on, Nicole. Um, and 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 for me, if if you, if you look at hurdles, sustainability is all about people. People in our communities, in government, in business, and the choices we make every day, and then the products we buy or make, and the food we eat, and how we live, and and the way we travel. And if I just look at transport, um, and, and you might have heard it earlier at the conference, uh, we've got a major car problem in Australia and New Zealand. Absolutely major. Road transport is the single last, largest source of carbon dioxide em emissions. It's almost contributing half, 43%. So cars and other passenger vehicles alone are responsible for 27% of New Zealand's gross carbon dioxide emissions. And, and We've got one of the highest per capita rates of emissions from road transport amongst all the OECD countries. In fact, in, in 2019, we, we were fifth highest. Sadly, only Australia was one of the four countries ahead of us. So it's, it's, it's in the USA and Canada, one of two others. It's, it's, it's that culture, is that mindset that, um, that is still here. Sprawling development is also certainly a hurdle in, in, in many cities. There, there's, there's clearly a change coming now recently, but urban development has not been commonly enough supported to development of, of quality, sustainable public transport network. You know, we're looking for developing 20 minute neighborhoods, as we call it. Um, it's a, it should be a planning priority to be serious if we want to live in decarbonized, livable cities. And, and yeah, again, if I just compare it with an international hat on, um, having worked in, and lived in, in several different countries in Europe, it's coming. 
but it's far away. The, the culture is, is so different. Um, I'll just use an example. I was, I was looking to buy a house here in Auckland. I know, don't start laughing. Uh, but the first, the first house we viewed, the, the real estate agent told us, look at this, three car parks. What about that? It was the first, was the first uh, immediate thing that was important. I, I follow the, the discussions here in Auckland around the cycle lanes that have been introduced and the nimbyism around that and, and businesses worried about losing one or two car parks on the front or thinking that they're going broke. Well, I can tell you in my own area where the cycle path has gone, it has gone in, the business is still there. You know, it's, it's all mindset and culture and, and it takes guts. That, that's where I think governments can, can further help us pushing the agenda. Already a lot is invested in it, which is great in, in, in public transport. We're very, uh, very pleased with that. But the whole urban development and, and daring to make choices to make active mode of transport and sustainable modes of transport really the priority and the focus. That's, that's, we've got a bit, bit to go there. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of tying those two points together, you know, I can give a business answer and, and the real easy business answer from the Bureau Veritas piece is, you know, challenges to Australian, New Zealand cities, hesitancy on what to do. Well, how do we get there? There's a product that, that we've provided to, you know, significantly sized organizations and it's five steps. Understand your carbon mapping, give assurance for the sustainability. So the process, the EMS quality assurance, carbon account. Um, put in processes for your late life asset management, introduce renewable energy and um, alternate fuel sources such as hydrogen. And then the very last tack is potentially carbon capture and storage. So we can apply that to any industry, whether it's a, a state um, body managing its office sites or whether it's um, uh, a, a ferry company or, or whether it's um, you know a, a, a bus transport operator, we can go through that process, de-risk it. You know, we've done it for a, a lot of people, but the, but the, the question is, people voting with their feet and, and what's the challenge? Well, for Australia and New Zealand cities, a lot of us are stuck in that third phase, which is late life asset management. And that includes management of infrastructure, roading infrastructure, the provision of services. And, and being in that place, a lot of focus so much goes on to the cold spring. Well, what do businesses want? They want to stay in business. So what's our, our key action is we'll just focus on managing the assets that, that we have available. So, you know, I think, and, and picking up on what Peter said, if we can af affect that psychology, the, the requirements from people in state to be more comfortable with, provide that assurance, we can address those challenges. And it's being done overseas. It's being done for large industries here in Australia and New Zealand, I think we just need to take that process, understand a verifiable path to go through all the steps and, and then implement it. And I think that's our solution. And I think, Nicole, you were mentioning the, the importance of, of having case studies, you know, or, uh, or success stories, which can show people that it's achievable. And that reminds me, uh, a couple of months ago, I was reading an article about Veolia introducing a fleet of 60 electric vehicles in London, in Westminster, where we do there some uh, waste municipal waste collection and some street sweeping. And I was really surprised to see that the, the figures in, in carbon emission reduction was 89%. So do, do, do we have other good success stories, let's say in, in the world, which are worth mentioning, just to give a bit of an idea of, you know, what can happen in this space? Yeah, and um, look, I'll probably pick up there just on um, Peter's Peter's topic, not to steal his thunder from the transport perspective there, but um, um, we, we have many case studies globally now with Schneider Electric on the implementation of EV charges. There's specific cases in New Zealand. It's not a specific customer that I can reference because it's not a public case study, but um, we have there's many, many case studies and examples that that we do have of just the benefits um, and the, the emissions reductions achieved as a result of um, EV charges. And perhaps I probably, it is, it is Peter's area of expertise. Um, so maybe I might throw, throw that question further to Peter and just how you're seeing that evolution um, or the implementation of EV charges and, and what sort of statistics that um, result in, in terms of emissions reductions. Uh, it's, go, it's, it's going very fast now, um, uh, purely from a transit perspective, uh, 
yeah, we're, we're currently a, a leading player in the, in the zero emission buses in uh, in Europe and, and here in New Zealand and, and across the ditch in in Australia. Um, but not only us. I mean, our friends and colleagues in other public transport companies are, are driving exactly the same. Um, and and it's not drawing inspiration only from from here, but it's from from our colleagues in France and in the Netherlands and in Sweden. And it's also about how to best support the energy transition which we've mm -hmm. been able to to share with our our partners here and um yeah today transit operates 1400 uh zeb zev uh, vehicles so um that's across 11 countries and and each year we we add new cities and new vehicles to the network um we, we've committed to doing our part to reduce the greenhouse gases i said uh, 30 percent reduction by by 2030 and uh yeah we've been on this journey now for a couple of years and we expect in 2025 uh, to have over 5,000 zero emission buses in operation across the world. So, and, and the operation, the, the whole experience, it tells us we, we need to go as big as possible from the beginning and we get great support mm -hmm. from uh, local authorities, get great support from uh, the government with that. Um, and, and for example, here in Auckland and New Zealand, we're, we're currently operating uh, zero emission buses in Auckland, uh, including a very exciting hydrogen bus trial uh, with uh, together with uh, with Auckland Transport and uh, yeah we do the same in Wellington Brisbane Melbourne Sydney with um, our zero emission buses and in Brisbane for example we've got our first uh, full size uh, electric bus 100% powered by renewable solar energy uh, which is which is collected by a, a network of 250 state of the art solar panels so it is coming and, and, and there, there's a more, there's a bigger announcement to come. I'm not allowed to say anything about that, but um, it's not here in New Zealand. It will be in Australia, but uh, keep, keep an eye out because yeah, Transit is going to do more together with um, local authorities in that space. And you just see the difference in uh, carbon footprint, but also physical footprint as a result mm -hmm. of it. I mean, I've got some wonderful stats of the difference between um, the, the CO2 two emission per passenger, if you compare uh for example a, a the rail with with a flight or a car so if, if if you've got a one one person in a car roughly 171 gram uh if you've got uh, a, a bus it's 104 gram and if you go to rail it's 41 gram at the moment and and buses that's and that's even linked to the normal diesel uh, uh fleet not not the um electric or the um hydrogen fleet so and coach uh, is, is is also similar 20 27 grams so the, the the difference is staggering if you just look at a domestic flight uh, including all the uh, effects of high altitude um, uh, it, it's a 254 grams per passenger so compare that to uh, rail where it's 41 so you, you, just, you just can see in the stats that the massive difference it uh, it makes Peter, can I can I question? Because um, I, I think that's all absolutely brilliant. But what I'd love to know from an operations piece is: Are you seeing all the all the additional benefits? Like, um, is the operational availability up? Is the mechanical complexity making maintenance faster? Uh, are assets, you know, higher utilized? So, you know, I think there's no question on the absolute benefits of the GHG reductions. But a message I'd love people to take away from this and potentially be, you know, hopefully we'll be questioned on it later on, is that the technology has so many tangible real benefits. So with introducing um, the, the hydrogen trial, the electric vehicles, what are you seeing on an operation side or a service delivery side that's falling out from having those things uh, replace internal combustion? So operationally, whilst, so, so life of batteries uh, improves, drastically has already drastically improved that that was obviously the key from an operational perspective is the uh, the length of um, the journeys that we can we can make with um, the electric vehicles uh, that that's improving very very well at the moment um, we also see infrastructure around it uh, now with volumes coming up significantly reducing in costs uh, with with the numbers that we are currently talking about and purely from an operational perspective um, for our drivers, a, a bus is a bus. It's mm -hmm. uh, it, it 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 doesn't make it, it doesn't make a, a difference. Um, mm -hmm. What what does make a difference is that we can advertise and show the public that mm -hmm. they are traveling in a zero emission vehicle, and and that slowly when when we talked earlier about passengers 
and people starting to vote with their feet. Mm. That's, I think, where the big benefit of recently comes from is, is the customer attraction to be absolutely certain that mm. you, you, you travel in a very sustainable mode of transport. So these things, whilst I, I was in, in, in London, I, as I said, uh, in, a, in a bus operation, and it's now nearly 10 years ago, and, and that's where we, we started with uh, our first trials of, of electric vehicles. Yeah, there was, there was loads of operational challenges to overcome. Um, mm -hmm. Technology has evolved so, so rapidly at the moment that um, I, do, I don't see any operational issues, Wayne, going forward. Uh, I, th th thank you, Peter. Dwayne, would you have any, an example worth mentioning in the maritime transport? Absolutely. So a, a very easy example is the move from uh, internal combustion passenger ferries. So uh, we've just had a, a, a significant contract supporting um, a fleet of 10 electric ferries in, in Portugal. And in that case, they are able to um, complete the journeys, uh, zero emissions, but the tangibles, which tech as almost a, a counterpoint to, or a complementary point to what Peter said, comforts up. So you no longer have a, a heavy diesel engine, uh, you no longer have the noise and vibration, and you lose all of the weight from the sound insulation, and you lose the complexity in systems. So we are able to tack on additional notations and additional approvals, which mean uh, passenger comfort significantly improved. And there's no loss in operational capability. Uh, admittedly, there has to be an adjustment in the charge times and, you know, what lengths can be done prior to, um, to hitting a charge station. But what, what is happening there is it's cleaner, it's much lower emissions, it's better for personnel, and we're seeing higher operational availability due to the reduced system complexity. So the, the, the winds in a urban transport setting is, you know, this promulgation of, of electric ferries. But then if we look at a more global narrative, the, the real winds we're seeing is, is diversification of technology and, and research. So what, what BV want to do, and I think inherently behind all of the panelists here, is we want to enable business and we want to enable society. So none of us here, and, and please jump in if this is an untrue statement, want to see change or environmental compliance mean damage to business, destruction to industry, or you know, unless you've got big pockets, you're out. And we, we want to see the solution for greenhouse gas emission work for everyone. So the success stories we're seeing in the maritime and offshore space is transition fuels. So whether it's um, LNG, uh, LNG dual fuel, move to hydrogen or things like uh, ammonia. So there's research, there's compliance criteria, the tanks uh, and design systems are being classified. And so on a big sort of what's the global impact piece, the success stories we're seeing is the adoption and the approval of technology and, and you know, really crazy stuff that, that really gets me waving my hands passionately um, is the approvals in principle for sail vessels, like modern uh, cargo ships, transport ships with uh, rigid sails, fixed sails uh, that improve efficiency over particular legs of a voyage. And, and to see this technology filter in as cutting edge, uh, I think sort of a really, really, really um, enabling and a very good step because what this prevents uh, is, okay, we've got a mandate, 2035, 2050, do stuff. But by having transition, energy transition enabling technologies, you know, we're seeing that be practical to allow businesses and societies and governments and states to keep operating without the step change where some either fall off or some either make it. So I think we've just heard lots of good examples. We've, we've heard as well that the technologies are there. There are lots of available technologies. So I was going to ask, you know, how can we go faster? You know, what role can state authorities and business to business providers play in getting there quicker? Um, if I could just jump in there, Alex, is, I mean, we've, we've spoken about it already just in terms of there's, there's so many case studies out there. And if we look at business to business, I think it's, it's, it's about sharing those, um, sharing those case studies and what's, what's worked well for others. When we also touched on some of the hesitancy there for some businesses to progress forward because they're not sure they're making the right investment, they're not sure how to get started. So I see businesses have a have a fundamental role there to play with other businesses in sharing those successes. And 
um, one of the things that I'm really proud of at Schneider Electric is that we're very open um, and very transparent about the, the changes that we've made in our own business. And we're very, we're very transparent about sharing those successes across our own factories and supply chain. And um, importantly there, it, 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 as long as sharing those successes and those case studies is just experience, sharing experience. Um, I, I, think that, I think that's re really quite, quite key. Um, not sure, Dwayne, I mean, from, from Maritime, how do, you, how do you see that? I um, forgive me, Peter, because I gee, I could talk for a long time, but I'll try not to. Um, th this I think is the most nuanced approach. So there's two pieces, and I'll bring it down to product life cycle, um, state and regulatory authority. So we'll say Maritime New Zealand or Ministry for Environment or MB, when they implement a requirement, so MARPOL, um, the requirement has to, and and I, this this I think is an absolute nuance. It has to require change but it also has to allow innovation. So in certain aspects, and I'll go back to fishing vessels, um, they have a high work cycle and a high duty cycle and a varying load. So the various optimizations that you can apply during a transit leg are far more difficult to, to apply within that type of vessel. So where I think state and business to business can work is state sets the requirements, business providers, actual companies can provide feedback and then we allow a combination of mandated compliance, but then ability to innovate and fit within the compliance. And so where I then talk back to product lifecycle is if industry and business are smart and we set the appropriate regulations with the appropriate, appropriate space, when the various subsets, so whether it's internal um, inshore fishers or whether it's transport or, or, or whether it's work vessels, whatever aspect, as the compliance requirements filter in, when you're getting rid of a 30 year old vessel, the new product cycle has to be mature, green, fitting with compliance so that business can step in and, and can then meet these new requirements, but not in a way that, that is damaging, that's gonna hit the profit or is gonna jeopardize the, the actual entity. So um, yeah, the new ones I see is working together and then allowing innovation in within an appropriate product cycle. That's really what I think we need to do. Peter, any, any additional comment on this? Yeah, business to business, I'm fully with Nicole. I, I think there's so much good practice and, and research, et cetera, globally across the world, uh, bringing that all together in a much more uh, comprehensive way and sharing best practice uh, across businesses, I think is key. Um, obviously, we're all in it together. And the, the state of, from a state authority, public transport authority perspective, I'm very excited about what's happening at the moment, to be honest. Um, there is a lot of uh, good plans. If, if I just look at Auckland, Auckland here, Auckland Transport has adopted a, a, a low emission bus roadmap, for example, really committed to purchasing only uh, zero emission buses from, from 2025 and reach a full fleet transition by 2040. You know, these are strong commitments to make in Metalink in Wellington, also actively transitioning to zero emission buses with 20% of the buses plan to be electric by 2023. So, there is absolutely the right political uh, and community and PTA uh, will to, to change. Um, what, what I believe is, is the next step is, is also to make that much clearer in, uh, to make that even much more priority in procurement processes. The bit where you refer to Duane is, um, yeah, we compete sometimes for contracts, but um, the sustainability angle, the, the innovation angle about um, sustainable solutions, uh, rewarding that in contracts and specifying that very clearly uh, up front, that will certainly, certainly help as well. Um, and I just, I, I just want to, to encourage uh, uh, local government and, and, and central governments to, to just keep making sustainability and, and, and decarbonization priority in these, in these tender contracts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Alex will come back to COP26. Um, I've got an opinion on, on, on that from a transport perspective. We'll, we can come back to that later, but there's clearly some work to do given how the transport day went there uh, with regards to the role that you know, we all can play to, to bring that much more to the forefront. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I, I'd like to explore digital transformation. Um, it, it's something which is impacting uh, all industries right now. 
what role do you think it plays in, in, in helping with decarbonization in the New Zealand industries? Um, look, I think, I mean, I think that a, that is a really in, important question there is um, the more digitised an operation is, the more the ability is, is to understand um, what, what your assets are doing. And so then you've got the ability there to, to optimise, to control, uh, to analyse. Um, and and that, that all flows through to, in reality, is it? The more optimized and digitized an operation is, then the more energy efficient that it that it becomes. So, uh, in a nutshell, it's it's one of the most critical aspects um, is that we, we need to accelerate faster towards digitization, because in a nutshell, it, it does lead to energy reductions. And an example where big data could help uh, achieving efficiencies in this field. Um. Well, I'm uh, happy to throw that to one of my like my um, panelists there. That question, yeah. maybe Dwayne, you've got some input there. Uh, look, it's it's a, a super interesting one, and some of this I'll talk theoretically only because I haven't personally had my hands on a big data um, success story. But the the first part with digitization is enabling information. So if you're doing an EEXI um, uh, or carbon intensity compliance, you need to have hands-on info and you want that information digitally available so it can be transmitted, approved and accepted. Super cool. But a piece that sits aside that is if you're able to have information on um, uh, ocean conditions, on operational conditions, on displacement, on, on um, trim, on sea state, and if you can bring all of that together, there's a very powerful ability uh, oh. Sorry, forgive me. I, th I think I may have just cut out quickly. All right. Apologies. You're good. You're good. I'm still here. Um, there's a very powerful ability to then um, journey manage. So if we look at the um, potential savings, depending on the operation, up to 17% of emissions can be reduced in a fully optimized uh, um, transit leg. So if if users are able to harness all of these varying inputs, then apply assessments to that and then drop out the, um, the optimized operational state, navigation state, movement around weather or, or other aspects, trim um, versus speed and load, then, then you know, potentially that can be up to a 17% saving. Um, we are looking at a tool, uh, not quite introduced yet, but as trying to bring this data together and then optimize around ports and inland navigation routes. So um, for our side, at least it's something we're aware of, but is still very much um, cutting edge and being looked at for the, for the um, offshore and uh, maritime space. Yeah. It's interesting the amount, of, um, the amount of data that businesses already capture compared to what, what they actually use and the insights they take from it. I think the statistics is around about 2%. So of all the data that's captured, only 2% um, is actually used for actionable insights. And so if we, we look at just the role of big data and the role of digitization, I mean, there's a very simple piece there in accelerating that journey is actually doing more with the data that we already are capturing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. from from a, from a transport perspective, just, just to add to that, technology and data, uh, they play a vital role in the public's travel choices and uh, in the information availability about people before they start traveling. And we see now with more digitization, uh, more forecasting uh, abilities about real-time information about where vehicles are. And that's actually a silver lining from COVID, to be honest, where mm. we were forced into introducing more technology and data to give customers more information about the travel choices during COVID. For mm -hmm. example, with occupancy rates of uh, vehicles coming onto um, uh, bus stops or, um, or, or stations. So it really forced us to think differently and to help customers making their travel choices. And, and that will continue in transport is, is to integrate different modes of transport, seeing it from a network perspective integrate the data from the different modes to give people travel choices, travel opportunities, and uh, 
give give people the chance to choose and it might be five minutes longer on a bus or five minutes longer on a train then if you go sometimes by car if you go uh, off peak however that time is well spent because you can read a paper or uh, do some work or have a have a sleep and, and people can make their own choices when they can make these these balances by having the right information and data available before they make the choice what mode of transport to travel with and um, that that's a key for us to uh, increase the uh, patronage on uh, on public transport can i can i throw a question um to either peter or nicole um how do we gain that trust because i think you know, the, our perspectives are from, from large industry. You know, we have the ability to pull large levers to gain significant uh, insight across a whole bunch of data metrics. But then the counter side to that is we need to have people trust to go, look, we want your GPS, we want your geotags, we want your activity, your operational state, um, because what we can do is offer this really good thing. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can generate that trust, not only in um, our, our B2B partners or, or agencies, but in customers to have them go, them go, yeah, by this level of monitoring, you know, here's this good. Um, what, what are your thoughts either on, on how to do that? That's a really big question there. And um, going into the realms of trust is, Typically, you look for examples where it's worked mm -hmm. previously before. So I think it, it definitely links back to sharing sharing those examples and and providing tangible tangible case studies. Mm. Um, but then, but then also importantly is I think when you're having when you're having those conversations with with the various businesses is really getting a deep understanding of what that business is looking to achieve. So that when you're providing a, a, a solution, whether it's um, something which is tried and tested or it's emerging technology, that you've got to align it really to the value that it's going to deliver to that business. And I think under, getting that level of understanding and that deep level of understanding, you understand what the objective is for that mm -hmm. particular business, then you've got you go into a place of a trusting relationship there and then then you eventually if it's emerging technology perhaps you're co-creating and you're treading new ground there together but you're in a trusting relationship um in, in order to progress forward yeah. my so, view there. Yeah. so do when you, uh, you, you your question was was probably as well you know um pointing out a, a barrier potentially to the use sometimes of those technologies or and, and picture you were mentioning data to be able to give to, uh, to, to the population in terms of public transport. What do you think are the main barriers, Peter, to the use of public transport? Because as you said, uh, uh, it's a significant component of carbon emissions. The savings using public transport compared to using private vehicles is huge. So what are the barriers and what can we do about it? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, when I just look at, I'll take Auckland as an example. Um, Auckland has grown dramatically in public transport usage in the last uh, decade, uh, from 2 million to 22 million, so ten, tenfold uh, growth on rail, more than 100 million uh, across the whole public transport uh, network. Pre-COVID, more than 50% of journeys into CBD were made by public transport. Um, uh, so. There is, a, there is a start of a success story. Um, if, you, if you look at sort of what, what are things that are in the way of further growing, one for me is uh, knowledge. It's, 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 there is still a perception in this city, and I was here 17 years ago when uh, there was one train an hour, it was a diesel train, they didn't run in the evenings and there were no trains in the weekend. Um, and compared to now where you've got 10 minute frequency electric trains, uh, high frequency, good frequencies during weekends and in the evenings, uh, bus coverage across the network, very much linked. Auckland Transport has done a great job in making it a, an integrated network where train stations are transfer points on the network where new stations are being built with all sorts of facilities. There's a lot of different perceptions uh, in Auckland. People still think that a lot of people have an opinion on public transport but when you ask, hey, when was the last time you used it? The, the, most of them say at the time that I was here 18 years ago and their experience was, was completely different to what public transport looks like now. So, so there, is, there is work to do in the space of making people aware, actually, the awareness space. 
Secondly, um, I also believe that what Auckland Transport does now is integrating all the modes of transport into one system does really help as well. If people don't see it as it's only you take the train or you only take the bus, no, it's the whole door-to-door -door experience. And that includes active modes of transport like cycling, walking, uh, transport on demand, you know, all the, all the modes of transport. If you can show that into one journey for customers, is a, a transfer often is a bit of a barrier, but if you can show, I go back to my information point, uh, if you can show people in advance, hey, look, um, the transfer time, it's only a couple of minutes at a station, and you know what, we'll tell you if a train is delayed or a, or a bus doesn't run, uh, and this is where your data comes in, Dwayne, um, but if, if, if people are willing to tell us what their preferences are, you know, ideal world, you would say, hey, you have to wait a little bit at Purinoe Station, but do you know that your favorite coffee is being sold uh, half a minute around the corner? You've got a couple of minutes to, to grab a coffee or, uh, you know, you you will end up at, uh, uh, at Mart and did you know that your favorite shop has got, uh, uh, you know, a discount on these types of, you know, you, you personalize people's experience mm -hmm. and guide people through the process because it can be sometimes very complex, but with, with data and information, Traveling by public transport becomes easier and smoother, and and that's for me the the, the future is is seeing it as a as a one big network. It's not only we're running trains or we're running buses, or it it is that full network that we need to explain to people that it's actually quite easy uh, to to travel by public transport and just try it. I mean, I'll, I'll use one example. Uh, Auckland Transport made. Um, public transport free when uh, we hit the 100 million journeys in uh, in Auckland, which which is was two years ago, and it was fabulous. It was on a Sunday, nice. and I positioned myself on the concourse um, at Britomart and just had a chat with the thousands of people that came on the Sunday out of the trains, families with children, and you started talking. And how many of these families told me, Peter, mm. I'd never appreciated that public transport is like this. We actually enjoyed it. We looked out of the window. The Eastern line is, has got the best view of any railway line here in, uh, in New Zealand. You know, people explained to me, I didn't know that public transport is already at this at this stage. So again, that, that awareness is, mm. is, is very important as well. And, and trial and error. And if, and, if, and if it doesn't work, because people rather sit in the car and uh, look at the brake lights of the car in front of them, that's that's people's personal choice, but at least try it. Yeah. Th th thank you, Peter. So look, I can see Tom is flying, you know, it's uh, it's such a great discussion. And uh, we've got a few more minutes before we move to questions. And I can tell you, I've already seen a long list of questions. So I definitely want to leave a bit of time to address those. J just in terms, you know, a, a bit as closing remarks, I, I was thinking about two things. Um, you know, COVID has been at the forefront of everything we're doing in the last four months, especially in Auckland. Um, what do you think, let's say, has COVID accelerated, decelerated the rate of decarbonizing here in New Zealand and, and in the world? I would say it, it, both because, it, I mean, I think you might have been you, Alex, that touched on it before is that, um, or apologies if it was Dwayne or Peter, that, um, it's, it's accelerated the need um, to digitise more. And as, as we've spoken about already, is the more digitised and electrified we are, then the, 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 we lower our carbon emissions. Um, give, given, given that fact is that there's going into, if I talk from an in, industrial perspective, um, a, a particular uh, plants, could be a water treatment plant, for example, there's been a requirement to have less people on site because of social distancing and, and of course, the, the COVID situation. What that's led to is that we need more remote monitoring. Um, so it's accelerating the need for it. Um, perhaps where we have um, slowed down is, is actually in implementing that because again, you've got less people able, able to be on site in order to implement the technologies that are, that are required. Um, and, and, and of course, I mean, we could say, yes, it could be a bit of, but I believe it's also a short-term impact as well. There's less planes in the air, for example. There's less people, a um, lot more people working in a hybrid environment, so more working from home. Um, but, is, but is that a short-term short impact? And what's, what's the longer-term impact? And um, 
that that that's where I think it's yes and no. I'm not sure I, if others agree with me there. Look, I, I fully agree with you, Nicole. And while you were saying that, I um, was just bringing up the the trends on oil prices per barrel, and um, you know. My personal opinion is over this time, we've been given an opportunity to move away from the consumption rates. Oil took a huge hit, it dropped down, and then there was no longer this large economic drive to stick behind fossil fuels and combustion engines. Uh, and, and so I think in that interim, this is where industry has been announcing, well, look, now's the time we're using this oil and gas, let's go green. Um, you know, who's a great barometer for what the future will be for public transport? Uh, and, and vehicles, Mercedes. Mercedes-Benz have always led with technology, always led with the adoption, and now they've said, look, no more combustion engines. Jaguar Land Rover, um, Ford, General Motors, now all promoting a full electric from generally 2030, 2035. So I think the impact from COVID allowed that breathing room where people acted, but then super counterintuitively, and what I hadn't expected is there is now a rebound. So as people are going back and doing stuff, well, what's the first technology off the shelf? Well, it's that plane or it's that diesel engine or it's that truck. And so now accordingly, um, commodity prices are back to around typical values around 80 US dollars a barrel. So so I'm Nicole, I'm seldom yes and no, but I'm exactly with you, yes and no. <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's really important as well, Is I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, coming off the back of COP26, there's been a lot of commitments made, mm. um, maybe not quite where we were, what we were hoping for them to be, but a lot of commitments have been made. Um, I think the time now is for action and it's all this talk of um, big businesses moving more to green energy and reverting more to renewable energy, digitising operations um, or processes, whatever that looks like is, the, the doing needs to start. I think that's mm. the real challenge ahead is actually taking action today because today is when the action needs to be taken. And, and I think that's yeah. a good le leeway to what was going to be a bit my closing remark uh, before we move to question. We've just heard about the, the outcome of COP26. Thoughts? Yeah, well, I already referred to it from a, um, from a public transport perspective. Uh, I can only say that uh, it, it was a very disappointing transport day. Um, whilst it is great to see the focus and, and, and the key focus was on switching to electric cars, uh, that doesn't hit any of the other ambitions that uh, we've got with mobility in the world because electric cars will still clog up the roads it is still uh, uh, by far not a safer mode to, uh, to travel than, than other modes of transport. And therefore we believe it's an, it's an absolute missed opportunity from a public transport perspective uh, to have such lack of focus on solutions that also not only help the carbon footprint, but particularly also help the physical footprint in uh, uh, urban and, and, and also rural rural environments. So yeah, from, from a public transport perspective, very disappointing. And that was exactly my point on the very first thing I said, you know, internationally, what are we seeing? Good stuff, understand, do clean things, but then hesitance and protectionism. And, and that's a part of the reason why I've discussed on trust and, and psychology and voting with your feet. Uh, and, and, and COP26 is a perfect example of that. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I really believe that overall businesses do underest the significant change that needs to happen from 2025 and onwards to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And I mean, as a result of the, of the back of COP26 is, again, I don't believe that we've, we're really getting the right momentum from that and, then, and the urgency that change needs to happen now or we've, we've got to start implementing and acting on the commitments being made. Yeah, so one of the questions we had, which I think is very relevant to this is, um, okay, we've, we've seen all those initiatives uh, uh, about reducing carbon emissions in, in, in transport. And we've seen the importance as well of transport emissions, you know, uh, globally. Are, are, are we going quickly enough, let's say, are we going to be able to, to have a significant dent on carbon emissions before 2030 in transport, especially. 
Peter, I, I suppose. Would you want to start on that one? Yeah, um, I, if I, and again, when, when we look at transport, I, I then focus again on public transport. Um, I am very much encouraged by the targets and the policies and, and that governments are currently putting in place around uh, bringing in electric vehicles uh, in, into, uh, into public transport. Uh, yes, it can always go faster. Uh, I, I think some parts of the world go faster, others, others slower. I think that's where the risk is. If you purely look at it from a global perspective, I think some, some areas in the world uh, are, are not going fast enough. Um, I'm quite encouraged from a, from a public transport perspective what local authorities and governments do and, and setting very clear targets now and, and really wanting to go to full electric fleet across, uh, across cities. Um, it can always it can always go faster, as, as I just referred to from a, from a global perspective. Not having public transport focus uh, there, it's not going to help the, the local authorities with future funding. I'm sure uh, if if it all if if most of the funding and research and development will go to cars again. So yeah, surely more can be done. I um I I think. You know, the direct answer is the rate of change fast enough? No. And, and, and various studies have said, look, we're not reducing at a rate that's going to meet um, the, the reduction rates that are being targeted um, by the Paris Accord, for example. Um, but what's the answer? I think the answer is commercial. If you want to accelerate change and you want to have businesses do stuff differently, you want people to do stuff differently, make it the most commercially feasible option, financially feasible option, that they adopt this new technology. So um, if we look at vehicles, for example, um, a 300 horsepower electric engine, the most energy dense version is now 10 kilograms, 22 pounds. So if, if we have the industry enabled and the products enabled so that people can go, hey, I can drive a 1,600 kg car at this cost per annum, or for 60% the acquisition price of the equivalent car, I can have an electric vehicle, which is 800 kgs, has X range, um, and is a more compelling product. When, when it's commercially the best decision, that's what will speed um, people uh, usage patterns, industry supply patterns. And until government and industry enable that outcome, I think the rate of change is only going to fall into large businesses like ourselves, those that are financially strong or able to accept risk, whereas the large majority of people who are balancing a profit and loss statement just aren't going to take that jump until we can make it you know, a, comp a commercially compelling and operationally compelling option. It, it doesn't always need to be uh, commercially driven, Dwayne, is, is, is my personal belief. If I purely look at transport um, and active modes of transport, like walking and cycling, mm. uh, I don't believe uh, we, we, don't, we do need a, a, a firm business case. Um, mm. That's a matter of convincing people to give more space to these active modes, particularly in cities. And that's, mm -hmm. I believe, if, if you ask me the question, are we going fast enough? No, because we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're missing big opportunities in uh, turning our urban environment, particularly into a active mode friendly environment to encourage people to uh, take a, a, a bicycle out or take a, um, a go out for a walk and not uh, mm -hmm. take the car. I just look in my own area. We've got a, a school that is five minutes walk Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the parents bring them in those four-wheel drive gas guzzlers uh, uh, just around the corner. Was it, it's it's an easy walk, you know. It, it's culture, it's attitude, yeah. it is it is behaviour, and that needs to be supported by the right infrastructure. The the fight uh, around uh, one metre roads. Well, I can tell you the roads here in Auckland, mm -hmm. uh, in 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 many areas, you can park on both sides of the roads, and you can you can still have a double lane motorway in the middle. Uh, it, it is it is culture it's it's that's not a commercial in my opinion a commercial decision that is a willingness to actively change people's behaviors into more active modes and we need to help and encourage people by having the right infrastructure people tell me it's um uh, uh unsafe to cycle in in auckland and uh, i'm born in a country as you can hear with my accent uh, uh where 
in, in the Netherlands, you, you learn to cycle almost uh, e uh, earlier than you learn to walk when you're born. There's more bicycles in the, in the, in the country than there are people. Mm. I, that I, is I, culture. I, that, is, that, yeah. is, that is something that you're brought up to. And, and I cycled through Auckland. And yes, it's a bit hilly. It's, uh, it's not as flat as in the Netherlands. And uh, you, you need to work a little bit harder. Uh, we, we call a speed hump in the Netherlands already a mountain. So it's, uh, it's, it's a, a bit different comparing. But that's, that's attitude. That is, mm -hmm. that is that's culture and helping people to make different decisions uh, in, in their lives. And, and, and that's where we can all help driving that together with, with governments and local authorities. I, um, I, I love a good debate and I'm very mindful of time, so I'll just try to be super quick. Um, I, I really think council wants that, but I would say they can't afford the infrastructure changes to, to do the paths, to do the roading, to do the compliance. I see as too much of an expensive option for them to pull because I, I fully agree it is psychology, it is people's behavior, but I in this particular example, I feel it's a build it and they will come. Um, you know, we, we walk our son to daycare. We're lucky enough to be able to do that. But gee, I would have been able to have um, loved to have cycled to our old office in Penrose, but big motorway, none of the infrastructure there to do it. And, and I, I don't trust motorists to, to ride on some of those busy streets. So um, yeah, as a healthy debate where I agree with your points, yeah, I feel the enabling pieces council can't afford it. So we, yeah, that, that, that's sort of my perspective there. It's, 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 it's an attitude. If I purely look out of the window here, and I look at how yeah. High Street compared to Queen Street. Mm. And during COVID, you know, it was actively, uh, mm. and that was also one of the silver linings of COVID. Mm. We've seen mm. cycling and walking significantly uh, increased and even the use of e-scooters. If, if uh, I saw reports in Melbourne, 70% uh, increase in use of e-scooters in, in CBD. It's one of the positives of it. If I purely look at High Street versus Queen Street, two parallel roads where Queen, High Street now has got significant space for pedestrians. It's, it's busier on High Street now with, with, uh, with people walking there than it is on Queen Street. Mm -hmm. And I'm you sure that, that, doesn't need, that doesn't need a lot of investment. It's just giving up a little bit of space uh, mm -hmm. from, from mm -hmm. for cars to, to other modes of transport. Hey, -ho, I'm, I'm, I'm on my um, active mode soapbox now. To <laughs> good, <laughs> it's good. Nicole, you were saying? Oh, Sorry, she's Nicole, frozen. I was interrupting you there. No, I think she's frozen. Oh, okay, she's dropped. Uh, look, we had, we had another question. Uh, let's, let's leave some time for Nicole to come back. But we touched briefly about COVID as being a disruptor with both some positive and negative, probably, uh, impact on the, on the speed of decarbonization. Mm -hmm. What do you think could be the other disruptors in the future which could prevent us from getting to the targets and, and what do we need to do, to do about them? Oh, I'm going to need some thought on that one. Peter, what are your thoughts first, mate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm going to public transport. It's just, just where I, it's winning, winning back people's trust. It's, 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 winning, it's winning the hearts and minds of people, giving them a, 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 the, the, the certainty of a safe environment. Um, I think is, is using, even if it's using pockets in, in the world where there has already been successes around it, if, if, and, and, and much more bringing that to the forefront. Um, I'm using the example of Walthamstow in, uh, in, in, in London, where decarbonization became uh, priority number one for, for the local council, and, and they decided how, how are we going to do that? Well, obviously with cars, being the biggest contributor, um, they decided very boldly to uh, make, make the center of, of Waltham store carless. And uh, on the day that um, it was opened, there was a coffin of the mayor being carried around with protesters mm. um, who really disliked the fact that they couldn't park their car in, in, in front of the, um, mm. uh, the, their local business anymore. Um, Nicole, Walthamstow, five years later, is now the example of uh, a new urban design in uh, major cities, and it's now rolled out across many different cities in, um, in, in the UK after a massive, massive political backlash. Mm. Yeah, I think political courage here is a, is a very uh, uh, mm. key area, and yes, it will be tough. I mean, it's not nice to see your own coffin being carried through the streets of Walthamstow, 
now the mayor is hailed as a, a visionary mm. who, who has brought a complete new concept mm. into, into the London urban environment. Uh, well, well, welcome back, Nicole. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, ju ju just before you logged off, we were exploring uh, one of the questions from the audience was around uh, disruptors, you know, similarly to COVID who has disrupted, uh, let's say the speed uh, of decarbonizing. Uh, can we expect other disruptors in the future and what should we do about it? And I've, I've been thinking about this one, Nicole, so I'll give you two seconds while I blabber <laughs> on so you, you could sort of think on it. Um, you know, I, I think the, the biggest disruption which has stemmed from COVID is chip, so chip shortages, material so shortages and, and, and labor shortages. And what we're seeing is an impact immediately on supply of vehicles, technologies, and you know the, the modern items, which are your, your greener computer controlled, more efficient systems. But the, the counter side to that, and it's, um, and it's a controversial one, but I'd say is, is um, increasing political tensions. So the big potential disruptions that I think could absolutely derail um, international progress to decarbonization is tensions um, between key superpowers and the effects that that will have on supply of goods and manufacture. And I, I think, um, you know, there is a genuine risk that if relationships sour the supply of a lot of these enabling pieces, um, you know, look at the locations of Tesla's gigafactories, um, all of that falls into jeopardy. And I think as a community, we need to ensure that's avoided. Um, because the first thing that will go off will be environmental uh, compliance if things get bad in those areas. Yeah, I mean, if we're if we're looking at disruption as disruption as a as a barrier, or a challenge, or a, or a speed hump to overcome, then yes, agree. Um, I don't believe that when looking at just the supply challenges, the chip shortages, the shortage of metals and plastics, for example. Um, it, it's a short term to short term impact. It shouldn't stop businesses, um, governments, it shouldn't stop them from planning because if, when you start planning, there's also that time implementation or that time lag between the planning and the implementation phase. So in, divert the attention and invest it there. Um, then we can also look at disruption in a positive way and using AI, for example, as disruption. So um, Digital, digital solutions, software solutions, that's not, that's not delayed by um, uh, supply shortages, for example. So we can, actually go, we can actually go faster. So look at AI as a disruptor and, and that being a disruption, which will then enable um, businesses to look at um, going faster with reducing emissions. And I could have said disruption there is um, internet stability, but um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe the, the timing was not perfect. <laughs> uh, for me, for me, the disruption would, would be uh, the lack of air travel. So the fact that people have been forced not to, to mm -hmm. not to travel by air, and that that is causing a change in mm -hmm. thinking about traveling, mm -hmm. and uh, the necess necess necessary whether it's necessary or not. I mentioned the examples of um, a hashtag stay on the ground type mm. of movements that are now coming up. I think, I think that's, a, that's an important disruptor. Uh, and, I, and I think some of that will absolutely stay in the coming decades. Mm -hmm. Particularly it forces, because it forces other modes of transport to up the game and, and mm. rail, is, rail is one of them. Yeah, so look, I think we've covered pretty much all the questions uh, which came from the audience. There was just one last one here about technolo technological change in the electric vehicle industry. You know, will it lead to significant reductions in urban tailpipe emissions? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and um, as a, to start the debate, I'm a huge optimist, but the, the technology, the disruptive tech I would love to see is an on-demand self-drive system. So people are all connected. You need a vehicle to take you somewhere to execute a task, go through your app, vehicle comes through, takes you, takes your gear. And then when it's done, goes to a charge station and then reallocates. Um, in the, the um, consumer space, uh, a two car family of those two cars, 93% of the time is spent in the garage. The utilized time per day is five to seven percent. So, you, so you've got an asset which is one consumed so much carbon in its production, but then is being used so inefficiently. So, my absolute hope, and I, 
I do believe it would be a thing. Maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's more. Depends on computing power is uh, on-demand self-drive uh, capability. And I think if that can come through, gee, we'd, we'd see huge reductions in, in tailpipe emissions. Thoughts? Thanks, Duane. Um, so I think we pretty much answered all the questions. And a, um, any closing remark from, uh, from anyone? I think I've spoken more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, th thanks everyone. I, 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 yeah, I can only say, Alex, that, that this, this is now the time. I mean, we, we, we talked about it before, but if there's any time that we need to push on, it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I just look and again, I put my public transport head on. Sorry, I can't, I can't resist. But, you know, even whilst, whilst numbers might be down compared to pre-COVID, they will come back and... Um, this is not the time to look at the, the current usage and say, hey, that's not the solution for the future. For me, it's the opposite. It's a reverse cycle. This is the time to invest extra because people will come back and uh, let's, not, let's not rest and, and focus on cars again. This is, mm -hmm. this is now the opportunity. We, we'll get people back in public transport. Please, government and public authorities and everyone keep, keep investing in these modes of transport that not only reduce the carbon footprint, but also the physical footprint and every and the safety of travel in uh, in the world. I can only emphasize that uh, at, at this time of uh, uh, yeah where where we are in the world. I, I think just going going on to that a little bit more as well is that in any in any investment in this area in um, reducing carbon emissions, um, it does come with a cost benefit because you're, you're using less energy and that comes as a cost benefit to, to, to any business. Um, and Peter, you were discussing before um, around the, the move more to public transport. Um, and let's expand that out across all businesses there is it's brand image as well. You're gonna have more, um, more customers, participation, which leads to uh, an upstream commercial impact, also. So we can look at we can look at the barriers, but I think we've, we really have to look at the the bigger picture here. And it's not just about the short term impact; it's about the long term impact that it has on your business, um, and of course the planet. Yeah. So thanks, everyone. I guess it would be fascinating to have a time machine and be able to go back twenty years ahead and actually see what has uh, what has happened. Uh, so look, I, I guess th th thanks, thanks again, uh, Nicole, Peter, Duane. I mean, that was a pleasure for me, you know, be uh, interacting with you guys today. And I guess I'll, uh, I'll head the, um, I'll give the, the conversation back to Vincent to introduce the, uh, the next interview and uh, panel discussion. Thanks everyone. Huh? Have a great day. And thanks to the audience for your questions. And uh, I hope you've, uh, you've learned as much as I did in, uh, in this hour and a half. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And Dwayne, Nico, Peter, uh, such a great discussion. And we can totally see your, your engagement. It was great to see, to see that today. You have certainly given some food for thought to our audience with these case studies and your analysis. And that should trigger more thinking around uh, the choice and use of public transportation and transportation as a whole. And uh, you, you have highlighted uh, that actions to accelerate the uh, decarbonization of New Zealand industries come from actually three tiers, um, communities, the customers, companies, and the government, all together despite the challenges that arise from the transition. So thank you for that. And as Alex uh, mentioned, for the audience and attendees, I'll invite you after a short 10 minutes breaks to uh, keep watching live because at 10.30, we have a joint interview with New Zealand Transport Agency and the Infrastructure Sustainability Council. Um, they will be uh, discussing, exchanging about how the ISC model has influenced the sustainability um, aspects and methods of New Zealand Transport Agency, but also it involves uh, the community and uh, cultural impact. And lastly, for today, we'll have a second panel discussion. It will be at 11.30 for an hour and a half, and it will be on how New Zealand culture is leading the way in terms of sustainability.
thank you very much and uh, you. see you in the next panel have a good day thanks everyone Bye. have a great day thanks